again and thanks for staying in with me. My studio guest tonight is a playwright, novelist, former practicing barrister, a man of many parts and much energy, and I nearly left out of that list of talents an interviewer of some considerable import, John Mortimer. So I've got to watch my P's and Q's. <laughs> Not at all. I think you're a marvellous interviewer. When, um, if I said to you, you've got, a, you've got John Mortimer to interview, what would be the most difficult question you could ask yourself? Well, uh, I usually start quite in a very gentle manner, you know, <laughs> and win their confidence, like I used to do with the prosecution witnesses in court, and then ask the worst questions. I mean, I always, I usually used to get round to ask them whether they believed in God, but that's not a particularly hard question. I mean, I'd answer that I'm a founder member of the Atheists for Christ Brigade, which is what I am. Uh, but I suppose I'd ask myself, if I wanted to be objectionable, that uh, being a champagne socialist gives you the pleasures of champagne combined with the moral uplift of being a socialist. And being a champagne conservative would be rather a miserable thing to be, and is that why I do it? And I would perhaps be stuck for a moment for an answer for that. In fact, you would be <laughs> anticipating the, the criticism that might have come to, to, you, to, to you by being called a champagne socialist, which, yes. of course, you've been called. And you've also gone, they've also gone on to be very nasty indeed about um, being one of the sort of um, left-wing sinkers, privileged sinkers, of Lady Antonia Fraser's court. Well... Yes, uh, we, uh, the 20th of June group, which yes. we had, which uh, now I think has been stunned, <laughs> stunned into some sort of disarray. Do you think that you, you've been very staunch, so I'm asking John Morton my yes. questions now, you've been very staunchly, consistently a left-wing thinker. As you get older, do you find yourself thinking about your politics through the eyes of your grandchildren rather than through your own eyes? Well, I'd be very depressed because I think the young people nowadays are extremely conservative. And everybody who's at Oxford with my daughter, uh, very few of them voted in the last election. And if they, if they did, I think they'd be quite conservative because that generation uh, never knew anything but a conservative government. And I go back at, at a considerable age to the first Labour government, which now nobody remembers at all, the great Attlee government after the war, in which the whole of society was changed, things like the welfare state, the uh, education, public health, everything was introduced. And so I've seen the Labour Party really through, through the light of that great triumph. And it's never quite um, lost that glamour for me. And, and certainly um, now I, I think that the, I think the, the process of going, growing old in fact makes you more revolutionary and more... Uh, Bolshe and generally anarchic mm. than staying young. But don't you think that's because I, I know what I find in myself is that I am Bolshe for another generation yeah. now. You know, I've had my whack, a well, good exactly. whack. And it's up to them. And I think that that's, that's perhaps after this election what I feel and what I, I think perhaps we both feel is that we've done it, we've, we've worked away and, and it hasn't been without effect because uh, even this government is affected by Labour principles, really. Mm. I mean, they're not going to ditch the health service. They talk about a classless society, at least. So we've, we've achieved that. And then it's up to them to mm. keep going. But you've got to, if you, if you had to interview Mr Major, you'd find him very nice, wouldn't you? Well, that's the trouble about Mr <laughs> Major, yes. I, I recently met Mr Major, and uh, he was frightfully nice and extraordinarily nice and was there without his jacket on and looking extremely relaxed and... Uh, I said, I heard you were very nice to Neil Kinnock when you were walking up to the steps of the throne and you said, uh, you know, Neil, it might have gone either way and if I'd lost, I'd know exactly how you feel and uh, you've done such a great job for the Labour Party. And he said, uh, well, it's very nice of you to tell me that because I feel much better now that I think Neil uh, says that about me and uh, I do think he's done a great job for the <laughs> Labour Party. And I had to move far away in case he went on being so nice. It absolutely eroded all my political <laughs> beliefs. <laughs> because somebody once said that you cannot like your enemies, you cannot grow to like your enemies too much, or you dilute your politics. Yes, but I think in a way that's why um, being a, a writer is better, infinitely better than being a politician. I think that there is. I think that liking your enemies is a great virtue, really. And I think that, uh, I mean, for instance, I wrote a, 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 an enemy in Paradise Persona called Leslie Titmus who has a certain amount in common with Norman Tebbit. 
And at the end of the book, at the end of writing two books about him, I really became quite fond of him. And I did an interview with Norman Tebbit, and a terrible sneaking affection for Norman Tebbit came over me, and I had to go away and sort of sober down, you know, and I'd take a coach uh, in order to get over it. But um, I think that you can't help liking, um, liking your enemies if you're writing about them, particularly if you write mm. about them effectively, and then you're grateful to them for making the book work. But uh, you, you made a very curious statement about being a writer. You said that a writer really only cares about writing, and this is very disconcerting for people who live with him or her. Yes. You're a writer. Exactly, and yes. You, you do, and you, I mean, you, you know, I mean, the picture of the writer botanising on his mother's grave is a sort of uh, final analysis of what a writer is, but I think you're always standing outside. You're always standing outside watching the scene, you know, and you're having a terrible row with your wife, and that's good. I mean, I have a, if any domestic quarrel goes immediately into the life of Rumpole and she who must be obeyed. And you can put any quarrel between people of whatever age or generation or so into, into them, into their matrimonial. And so my wife's uh, and my disagreements go straight into Rumpo. And does she like your attitude to, to her disagreements? Because she may... Not at all. No, no she may object <laughs> and say, that's not at all what I said. That's not right. at all, however. That's not at all. Also, it's quite annoying to have it go into her, mm. Mrs Rumpo. So I think, that, I think that the life of a writer is constantly... And, I mean, I can remember when I was a child, uh, the great thing I, I think about a writer's childhood is that I was always seeing... Mind you, I was an only child. So I was always talking about myself to myself. I was saying, you know, look, look at him doing these extraordinary things. Why is he running around the garden and pretending to be a horse? You know, he's the most extraordinary person this is. So I was always the person observing myself. Mm. That's interesting because it, when I used to be on my own as a child, though I wasn't an only child, that's exactly what used to happen yeah. to me. A voice in my head used to almost comment on what I was doing, that's if right. I were on my own. That's right. Because I don't think children <coughs> on the whole like being on their own. Do you, would you say that's well, true? Well, I, I didn't have much. <coughs> I didn't have much choice. I had a blind father who didn't want any visitors, because he didn't want anyone to be sorry for him. And if my mother said there was a visitor at the gate, he would creep into the shrubbery and hide until you know the danger was past. And uh, I didn't have any brothers and sisters, so most of the holidays, at any rate, I was alone. And I liked that much better than being at school, really. Mm. Better than being at school, but I, I still felt I when I read your. I have read your autobiography, mm. I have seen Voyage mm. Around My Father, um, and terrifically good accounts of both those are. One thing I would have gone on persisting mm. about with you, if I'd been interviewing mm. then when you yeah. brought him out, is that I never felt you really wanted to explore uh, that hurt in that boy. Because if, if my father had gone blind like your father had, I would have been te felt terribly insecure, really terribly insecure and angry with him because he was not being this strong figure that I needed. Did you never, ever feel that about him? Well, funnily enough, I don't know that I'd needed a strong figure. He was a, he was a very strong figure, but he never gave me any sort of direction. He never told me the difference between right and wrong, so I'm very hazy about it at the moment. And uh, he was, but he told me an awful lot. I mean, he, he told me all the Sherlock Holmes stories and he told me all the plays of Shakespeare. He told me those things, but I never, I've never, I don't think I've ever in my life felt the need of a, of, of a strong leader, at all. Mm. Um, and I think perhaps that's part of being a lonely child. Are you a strong leader then? Not really. No. no. Because you see, I've been reading your novel, mm. Dunster, and I think that if I had to guess, you are Philip Progmire. Yes. Terrible name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but are you him? Actually, I rather like the name Progba. I was on, I was on a vacation on a ship, and, the, and somebody kept on talking about prop, what I thought was Progba. And in fact, it was the prop buyer, the man who <laughs> bought the props. But I thought, what a wonderful name, Progba. So I put it in my book. <laughs> I can't remember it. That's why I called it an awful name. Yeah. And he sounds stuffy. But well, I, I mean, the book is about, about two ways of looking at life. You either, you either compromise and want people to be happy and want people to not to have to be faced the awfulnesses of their lives and the awfulnesses of themselves, or else you ferret out the truth at all costs and make them face up to it. And out of those two attitudes, I think I like the man who uh, opts for an easy life better. Mm, mm. I think people who, who insist on finding out the truth, insist on facing people with the truth, insist on facing people with the errors of their past, do uh, probably more harm than good. Mm. 
In the book, um, in fact, uh, Dunster says to Philip, you'll feel better now, he called after Philip. Now you know the truth. Of course you will. You can live life as it really is, not as you hoped it was going to be. We can all feel better. Now we're honest with each other. Just take the truth out and look at it. Cope with it. You can't kid yourself, old man. You can't go on pretending that nothing exists unless you like it. Well, that situation there was that Dunster was having an affair with Progmire's wife. Progmire knew nothing of this, and Progmire's wife would never have told him if Dunster hadn't told him. But Dunster takes it upon himself, for moral reasons, to let him know. And so therefore Dunster really is in an intolerable situation because he's not only having it off with the man's wife, but he's mm. getting a great deal of moral self-satisfaction by being the one who makes him force and forced him to look at the truth. I think that's a very unsympathetic attitude of Dunster. And I'm not sure whether the Progmires might have gone on for years quite happily in that situation. But you see, that's, that's what interested me. Was, would you think that you would rather not know some truths then? Oh, yes, I, I, th I think so. I mean, in fact, the play, uh, the, the book has a lot, to, owes a lot to a play called The Wild Duck, a play of Ibsen, in which is the Dunster character is Gregor's Verlo, who informs these people the truth about themselves with the result that the girl commits suicide and tells them that all their dreams are illusions and so on. Um, I don't know. I think, I think that when I'm writing, of course, if, if you're writing, what concerns you is the truth. If you're not going to tell the truth when you're writing, then your writing is of no value. But uh, the rest of my life was being a barrister. And a defence barrister's uh, occupation, really, is keeping too much of the truth from emerging at inconvenient moments, you know. Do you think that you'd have ever uh, given up law if you hadn't found you had a gift to write? Well, I, I wrote, I always wrote. Yes. And, and writing was the first thing I did. I mean, yeah. I, I first of all worked as a, a script writer in a, in a film unit, and then I'd, I, so I'd written my first novel. So bar barristering was my sort of day job, you know, it was sort of waitressing like uh, girls who want to be actresses, do a bit of waitressing or take a typing course. Was that because your father influenced you in, into, into wanting to go into that? Well, not particularly wanting to, but I mean, I, I knew that uh, my father very cleverly said, you know, you'll be a very successful writer, but just until you are, divorce a few people, you know, there's nothing much in it and it's perfectly simple and it provides a steady income. And he also said writers' wives have ghastly lives because uh, the writer's always at home making tea and stumped for words and miserable. So that was, the, uh, that was the job that was open to me, and that mm. was what I did. Mm. And really, perhaps wrongly, I became rather too good at it, and I, I, I then got too much into it, and I became a QC, and I defended murderers, and it was all rather exciting. So perhaps I stayed there too long. Mm. But then on the other hand, if I hadn't, I wouldn't have ever found Rumpole or found out about the things I write about. <laughs> The thing that um, I wondered was at the moment when the law strikes terror, in, well, into my heart anyway, yeah. because I can't believe how many people have been imprisoned for 16 years and then they're innocent. And why it or takes not 16 years. Yeah. To 16 find years. Yeah. What, what has the law been doing while they've been there for 16 years? Trying to find, find, doing nothing, of course, is the answer to that, because everything in the law takes an infinitely long time. I think there are two things to be said about that. One is that the most perfect system of criminal justice, and I think we do have a very good system of criminal mm. justice, isn't run by computers, it's run by human beings, and human beings are infinitely susceptible mm. to prejudice, error, anger, constipation, everything which blurs your judgment. So therefore they're bound to go wrong, trials are bound to go wrong. The second thing is that it's, it's, it's perhaps encouraging that we're now having a flood of finding out about these things that went wrong. And a great deal of the things that went wrong weren't the fault of the, of the lawyers, but the fault of the police who manufactured evidence and told untruths, or scientists who tried to please the police and so on. So it's not all down to the law. But what it does need is, of course, a much better system of appeal and, and retrials and so on and all the things which they're doing too late, like telling the prosecution they've got to hand over all the evidence and so on. Because, I mean, it, se it seemed to me, to, well, no, and I could be completely wrong, but that the defence was the weakest part of all this. 
that the defence didn't somehow come up with some defence? Well, because they weren't told the facts. I mean, they, right. weren't, be, they weren't being given the facts. But I think that, that the best of trials, and I, in the book, Dunster, there's a libel action at the end about a, a man who's accused of a war crime. Uh, and really, I tried to write that to show that a trial doesn't ever really reach the truth, you know. You can go through the best system and it just totally misses the point of what really happened. And what really happened is something you may never find out. Mm. Because if you win, if, 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 if you get somebody off, you don't get them off because they're innocent. You get them off because the prosecution mm. hasn't offered enough evidence. Right. So you're not left with an answer as to whether they're guilty or innocent. You're left simply with the answer of whether or not the case has been... Which is proved. why some people can defend when they know the person is guilty then. Exactly, it's no problem at all, that. Because you're never trying to prove they're innocent. All you're trying to say is that you, there isn't enough evidence to convince a jury that they must be guilty. Mm. And so there's sa the same right for somebody who is potentially guilty as for somebody who is innocent. Yeah, and it's not for you to decide that if you're a defending barrister. You, no. Your opinion is absolutely unnecessary. When you... Um, uh, once wrote about uh, writing and a writer, you said an interesting thing, which I've slightly discovered mm. myself since I've written a book, and that is that once you've written about someone, like let's say your father, yeah. uh, he almost doesn't belong to you anymore. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's rather sad in a way. Um, I mean, one thing about my father, I wrote a, a book about him, I wrote a play about him, mm. And I can now no longer remember which of the things he actually said and which mm. of the bits of his dialogue that I made up. Okay. And in a way, he's gone out and he's become a character like Rumpo. I mean, Rumpo seems to me real. My father seems to me unreal in sort of equal proportions. Mm. And I think that's another thing about the writer's life, the writer who stands aside, outside people. The other sadness about his life is that most people keep their fathers in their minds and keep their past, keep their memories. But we're forever turning it out, you know, turning it out into books and giving it away to the world. And it leaves you with a curiously empty feeling, in a way. And in fact, um, clinging to the wreckage ends, ends with a line which says, uh, these are some of the things that happened before they left me and went away into a book. That's right. You know, so that it's, it's, it, it does. And so even the, the years since I wrote that book, see, I've still got, but those years seem to have gone. But in that way, it's kind of impoverishing your memory almost. It is, it is. And, and, and fact and fiction become blurred in your memory. You don't, know which, you don't really know which is which. Mm. But you do have uh, the positive side of all that, is that when things are awful and when things go wrong or when things are sad, you have that catharsis, which perhaps other people don't, mm. of, of being able to turn them, into a, turn them into a book. Did your mother ever read what you wrote about your father? Yeah, but she thought it was awful. She did. I mean, she she thought that it was it was terribly, terribly vulgar to uh, to write about your par write about your family. She thought that was awful, and that was sad because um, you know she died thinking that. Mm. When um, you don't like illness, do you also not like growing old? Well, I don't feel the slightest difference. You know, I mean, I don't. I feel exactly the same as when I was about to play Richard the Second, having this interview. Nervous, elated. Um, Incompetent, you know. Generally, just the same. I don't. I don't think. I don't think you learn anything. I mean, you learn a lot of facts, but you don't learn any new attitude to life. I, I don't feel any different, and I never felt particularly active, so it hasn't made much difference to me. Mm. What well, active in that you you've never been a very physical person. No. No. Because no. you you weren't a keen gardener like your your. Well, your I do garden, but I don't. But I've never you know rushed up mountains or skied or done things. No. Like that. So sport is definitely not. Definitely, you, yeah. you are an arty, not a hearty. Yeah, and I can't yeah. bear. I mean, I can't even bear to play snap. I don't care who we. I only want it to be over as quickly as possible. Mm. Do you find it melancholy growing old then? Well, it is melancholy growing old, and it's melancholy um, thinking that you're not going to know your children. I mean, I've got a young children and, uh, and young and you feel you're not and grandchildren you feel you're not going to know them mm, for that's terrible. very long which is sad. I know that's kind of and it, it's like uh, it's like having you know you know them for the age of a dog really it's like, a, it's like keeping a dog um, and that's that I suppose is sad. Mm. But do you sort of feel that um, they're inheriting as bad a world as some people would have us now believe? I'm not sure about that. I think, 
I think it's a very tough world to be young in. Yes, I do. I think mm. it is. It's a very hard world to be young. I mean, even if you take the 60s, for instance, or the 70s, nobody thought about getting a job. They, they left school, they left university, they got a job, some sort of a job. And I think that's very hard. I think it's also a sad world in that morality, talking about 1945, morality has, has left politics. I mean, if somebody wanted to go into politics because they believed passionately in something, I don't know where they would go to. I don't think they'd go into politics at all. What, no, no party would no fill party, that? No though. party would fill that. You think there. it's much more of an ambitious um, area now, or um, practical, yeah, or what? Yeah, practically boring area, really. Mm. I mean, you know, we were brought up to believe passionately, really, in something political, and uh, that's gone. But on the other hand, they'll have a good time. I'm yeah, sure. but why? Why have we lost it? I, I, I think we've lost it because of Mrs Thatcher, really. Uh, that, those years and it's not even as much as that they've not only lost idealism but they've lost even the idea of seeing that it's better for your own self to live in a fairer world haven't they that you can't mm. live in a world with high unemployment and people sleeping in the street just for your own well-being they, they can't even see as far as that mm. but it, it, it seems that somehow I mean if you I don't know how we can blame Mrs Thatcher no. I know Everybody uses her name, and I, I'm not a great supporter myself, but I, I think she must have stirred yes. in people something that was hanging yes. around. And I, I, and, and I don't quite understand that. I, I never have been able to... I suppose those, those years sort of legitimised feelings which were, were in people. Mm. And I suppose pendulums swing anyway, don't they? They swing mm. against... And the Labour Party had got into an unsatisfactory situation. Mm. So it can't be forever. Mm. So our young mustn't despair. What do you attribute your good humour to? Because you have got a great deal of it, haven't you? Very good humoured person, are you not? Well, I get into moods, but I, oh, do I, I think... Um, well, I, mean, I think my father was quite funny, he, and he, he, he remained very funny when he was blind. And uh, I suppose if you think... if you, if you I think that... A pessimistic attitude to life is a good basis for being cheerful. But I mean, if you don't expect very much of it, you know, everything that happens is a plus. But what I used to do with all my clients, you know, is uh, before they went into court, I'd tell them they were likely to get 12 years, and when they were fined three pounds ten, you know, they'd come out incredibly <laughs> elated. So I always tell myself the most awful thing is going to happen. <laughs> if it's any... <laughs> So, in other words, that is really a cockeyed optimist. Yes, there, isn't it, it is. It well, is. that's jolly nice. Yeah. And I'm very, very glad that you've been able to come and talk to well, me it's been today, a great John delight. Mortimer. A real pleasure. Thank you very much Not indeed. John Mortimer's success as a writer has been with him for many years, but next week I'm off to talk with a writer for whom success came much later in life. I'll be visiting Mary Wesley, whose novel, The Camomile Lawn, was shown here on Channel 4 earlier in the year. So, join me then. Same time, same place. Until next week. Goodbye.